Welcome back to Realism Overhaul, a summary of events which happen live on Twitch, link is below. Today we will be planting our first flag on the surface of the moon, forever scratching off one celestial body from our grand list of planets and moons to plant a flag on. Of course, we've already landed on the moon before during the Lucky 7 mission, but at the time we didn't have the astronaut complex fully upgraded yet, which meant no flags, and that mission was just a mess from the start, honestly. It took nearly a dozen launches to get all our fuel into lunar orbit, send a lander out there ahead of time which died, and after getting out to push our spacecraft towards a rendezvous trajectory after RCS ran dry, we almost failed to extract the lander from its fuel array, and it still ended up not fully fueled. But we made that landing and return work anyway. The point is, we nearly lost two Kerbals that mission, and it was driven by contract deadlines that gave us no other choice, as we would have gone bankrupt if we didn't do what we did. But that's in the past now. Our infrastructure and management is far better than it was merely a few years ago in game now. The Aurora Borealis mission is not bound by contract deadlines this time around. As such, we can choose to abort at any stage without consequence. We have the time and funds to launch again and again without risk of bankruptcy whatsoever. So for once, we can take a deep breath and not rely on luck. But speaking of luck, we might still have use for it for complicated missions like this. During the very first launch of a Nebula rocket, we experienced two anomalies. The first was during first stage separation, where one of our set motors did not fire correctly. This caused the first stage to skew sideways initially, and I believe a collision may have occurred between its structural sidewall and hardware on the second stage. Though I think we lucked out, because nothing critical appeared to have been damaged, if anything at all. And the second stage fired perfectly fine. The second anomaly occurred during the final moments of stage 3's burn, when one of our four J2 engines experienced performance loss, which effectively cut the engine's ISP in half. The ramifications of this are all four engines burning had its performance cut, immediately creating a deficit of roughly 200 meters per second. Fuel needed to reach orbit with that third stage. So with less than a minute remaining, we shut off the problematic engine and the engine adjacent to it to account for the center of thrust shift. The third stage then performed orbital insertion nominally, though running only half of its engines at the end, negating all performance loss whatsoever. It wasn't a necessary reaction per se, as the fourth stage could very well have performed the small, final push to orbit, but not needing to minimizes the number of ignition events, and therefore minimizes the chance of failure events. All in all, the Nebula rocket performed wonderfully for its first launch. This is actually a rocket I designed on stream 9 months ago, and it has taken us this long to actually get our first chance at flying it. 7 F1s on the first stage, two insulated airlit F1s on the second stage, and four J2s on the third stage. Now, if you're wondering why on earth it uses tank clusters like crazy like this, well the answer has to do with that nine months ago I mentioned just now. Back then, we did not have much money to spare. 
and I needed something that could lift Aurora Borealis with a lunar transfer stage into orbit of the Earth, but it needed to be cheap. It actually wasn't my first choice even. Uh, my first design was called Cardinal, you'll see here. Uh, I planned on using it for this mission. It had a retro sci-fi sleek look to it that I, it just would have been fantastic. But the tank design I went with would have cost roughly 2 million funds to tool, which was simply an impossibility. So I had to look at other options. And the tank clusters that Nebula uses basically negates all this. It's They're all identical. You've got 14 tanks in the first stage, 4 on the second, and 4 on the third, and they all relatively have the same dimensions. This basically means I only have to tool one of those small-ish tanks that gets reused all over the place, which is fantastic for our wallet. Tooling was almost, it was really cheap. Uh, but of course now, at this point, we're rolling with 7 million spare funds in our wallet and our space center facilities are all practically max level. So, I mean, I guess Cardinal is technically an option again, but we probably won't utilize it since, well, I've got other grand sci-fi ideas that will require funding. But more on that in another video. Aurora Borealis has reached lunar space, going on three days since liftoff, and it will take a several minute long burn to capture into low orbit. On the way here though, we got to run a two hour long television broadcast science experiment, twice actually, once in space high above the Earth, the other high above the Moon. During the stream, we watched an Apollo TV broadcast while coasting and it was actually quite fun. I'll probably do stuff like that again, who knows. Uh, anyways, the Kerbals putting on said broadcast are none other than Jack, the first Kerbal to reach lunar orbit, Herman and Werner Kerman. Those two are both newbies on the ride of their life. After drawing straws to decide, Herman will be left in lunar orbit, while Jack and Werner reach the surface in the Borealis lunar lander. And by now, we've got a pretty good look at its design. Honestly, it is very similar to Apollo's lunar excursion module, the primary difference being exposed tanks. The whole mission plan is very Apollo-like in fact, which makes it quite fun and familiar I'd say. The lander, just like the launch vehicle, also went through a few design phases like half a year ago. I'm pretty sure the first design had tanks encompassed in an egg-shaped fairing, and even though I made it very shiny, it just didn't look good. The design we ended up with here, I'm actually quite proud of, and I'm so happy that we're finally getting to utilize it. Herman takes control of Aurora and swings it around Jack and Werner to inspect the lander, and also to have a little fun. Exterior looks go, all systems seem go, so Borealis is cleared for a landing attempt. It will require two burns to complete. The first will be a short firing to more or less estimate a landing zone and initiate a suborbital trajectory. The second burn will be to land on the surface. Immediately after firing the engine for its landing burn, the second one, Vapor and feed lines cause the ignition to fail, and the engine shuts down. Well, that's not great, but the engine has three ignitions, and we've got one left, so I wait a few moments, push the thrust to full, and the candle stays lit this time. Thankfully, too. Although there isn't pressure to make the landing, I'd still rather not have to abort. Uh, but despite the failed ignition, and lighting the engine late, a slight attitude correction all the way down will be more than sufficient to accommodate for the situation. Jack and Werner use their instruments and visuals through the viewing window to approach the surface. Starting to get close, Borealis rolls 180 degrees to bring the viewing window in front of them, allowing visual of the lunar surface all the way from ignition to touchdown. Nearing their final approach, this is it. Contact and engine shutoff. 
With a pretty big lurch to the right, they have done it. Borealis has landed. For the second time in history, N9SA has successfully placed Kerbals on the moon. And for the first time in history, we intend to slap a flag on it and call it our own. Now in order for Jack and Werner to claim their silver and bronze medals for the race to the moon's surface, they must first navigate one of the most infamous devices known to all Kerbal kind, the ladder. While utilizing one, Kerbals very easily get confused. Up turns to down, slight outward angles turn to impenetrable barriers, and our first Kerbal easily falls victim to this, resorting to basically turning around on top of the slide to come back in. Jack, waiting behind him, grows impatient and pushes Werner out, saying, it's low gravity, what are you afraid of? And well, an impromptu experiment was performed that day relating to the bounciness of a Kerbal spacesuits on the lunar surface. Turns out, the result is very. One down, one to go. Despite witnessing the whole ordeal, Jack has no better luck navigating the horrifying ladder either. The whole up-down impenetrable barrier thing is no joke, and frankly should be part of the mission manual for all future flights at this point. The second Borealis lander, already in construction, should definitely have a modified ladder or something. Maybe not. But anyways, after several attempts, Jack decides it would be much more efficient to simply fall down as well. After the push earlier, he probably deserves it too. One way failed, then another, both of our Kerbals are safely on the surface of the moon. And after looking around and collecting their favorite rocks to bring back home, Jack gets to work planting a flag and leaving a plaque behind, which reads as follows. We dedicate this plaque for those crazy pilots of the Lucky 7 mission who came before us. Nebula was a hell of a ride. Jack. It's all so incredible. We surely can't bring back enough rocks. Werner. Werner decides to go looking for more rocks to collect. Frankly, a lot of them by Borealis have been scorched by the descent engine anyway. And despite the awkward waddle and low gravity, the prospect of walking around where nobody's ever been before sits in a little, but not too deep. Shiny rocks grab the attention of Werner much easier than introspective thought. On the way back, Werner discovers just how high he is able to jump on the moon, and it's incredible. Unlike back home on Earth, he can easily jump three times his own height. If only lunar basketball were a thing, maybe he could petition N9SA to bring a couple hoops on one of the coming landing missions. I mean, outposts are going to be a thing soon, maybe we'll slap a hoop on the side of one for the hell of it, I don't know. But hoops aside, Werner sneaks up on Jack as he comes back to try and scare him by leapfrogging him. Unfortunately, the trajectory was a bit off, landing Werner on his butt in front of him, but scaring the heck out of Jack regardless though, so mission accomplished? The two then practice belly flopping, front flipping, and determining whether or not tackle football on the moon should be allowed. In the end, they determine flag is probably a better sales pitch, and they just won't tell ground control what it actually is. Well, they've filled their pockets with rocks and dust, they've probably cracked and dented their visors by now as well, I'd say it's getting around the time they head back into Borealis before anyone gets hurt. Unfortunately, once again, they must brave their greatest weakness again to re-enter the lander. Somehow, despite just as many ups and downs as before, the Kerbals are able to make it past a slight outward angle and upside down to the door. Entering Borealis, their EVA is now complete, and now they'll have to wait for Aurora to be in the right place above them to lift off of the surface and come back home.
crew of three have made it back safe and sound, a flag now planted on the moon. Plenty more to come, but for now, I want to thank you all so much for watching, and peace out. Ooh,